on behalf of Alternative Policy Solutions, uh, the project organizing uh, this talk, which is a nonpartisan uh, policy project based at the American University in Cairo, where we are, uh, and holding monthly lectures like the ones we're here. I urge you to check out uh, the website, which is aps.aucegypt.edu. We have weekly commentaries, we have a youth competition for policy development, and we sure have alternative uh, policy solutions for many of uh, Egypt's problems, at least we hope so. Uh, on behalf of my colleagues uh, at APS, I would like uh, to warmly uh, welcome David Sims. David, as all of you know, is a renowned expert on urban uh, development uh, and housing. He is a long resident uh, of Egypt. Uh, he is the author of uh, Understanding Cairo, The Logic of a City Out of Control, and Egypt's uh, Desert Dreams, Development or, or Disaster, uh, of which we are seeing uh, a lot of now. The topic for today's talk, uh, we believe at APS, is very timely, and this is why we were keen uh, to have David Sims come and join us um, to answer uh, a lot of questions. Uh, there's the new capital uh, being built. There's the Alamein capital or uh, city uh, on the north coast. At the same time, uh, there is a collapsing infrastructure in the city of Cairo and many other uh, cities across Egypt. There are people uh, who recently lost their lives in a train uh, crash what I would think of as an unavoidable uh, train crash. Uh, so between those two extremes of mega projects, uh, luxury housing, um, new cities and whatnot, and that uh, dwindling uh, capacity of the existing city to house uh, its residents uh, properly, uh, where do we stand? I'm sure uh, many of you, just like myself, uh, have many questions uh, for David. So I will not take longer. Uh, David will uh, give the time for questions and answers right after he is done uh, with his lecture. David, thank you very much uh, for being here. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> The, the, the topic is not, I'm trying to, uh, in a way, explain uh, why there is such a uh, preoccupation with uh, desert land, with public land, uh, which seems to be capturing more and more of uh, Egyptian <clears throat> development policy. Uh, and why am I doing this? Uh, it's a gentle message. It's, it's understandable. Uh, and I hope that this will, can be used uh, by the government to not re reconsider, but to at least understand why uh, the headlong uh, uh, march into empty spaces uh, is not everything. And the topic is uh, this, this, what I call the distorting luxury of infinite space. Uh, it, it, it means I, I, I come to the problematique, which is often uh, talked about, which is Egypt, you know, is on 7% of the land, or is it 6, or is it 9? And it has, as you can see, uh, it's confined into the Nile Valley and the Delta. And if you look at the map, it's, it's almost mouth-watering how you should be able to, you should get out from this confined 
and crowded uh, <coughs> valley. But is Egypt unique? Uh, it has, there aren't many countries that have such a vast uh, stock of empty public land. Uh, those that do are mainly Arab countries, mainly Gulf countries. Uh, and there's the Dubai parallel. But none have so much land as Egypt in the hands of the state and so much which is so near to the built up areas and where the economy, uh, the economy operates. So it should be a great gift. Uh, those of us who work in urban development realize that usually you, you're faced with land acquisition costs. Uh, most land around, the hinterlands of most towns, most areas are uh, in private hands. They're usually agriculture of one sort or another. And in order to expand, you need to purchase this land, either through eminent domain or through uh, land assembly. It's a great expense, uh, uh, potential and should be taken up. But could one say that Egypt actually has a land curse? I think you all have heard of the phrase natural resource curse, which is usually petrol or mining or other uh, resources which allow governments in this part of the world, certainly, and also in Africa and other places, to uh, create situations where, uh, of rent, where you don't really have to do much because you can just sell some more oil. And you name it. Uh, every Gulf country, Iraq, Libya, uh, Namibia, you name it, uh, has shown over time that it's very hard to use these resources productively. So, what about it? In, uh, I'm just, I'm not going to go through this. You probably should all have an understanding of the public land that exists in Egypt and its historical uh, uh, narrative. Uh, the amount of land which is empty remains today at about 800,000 square kilometers, which is 80% of Egypt. Uh, a lot of that, actually, is, has been designated as protected areas. If you take that away, there's, it's more like 10%. Anyway, uh, the first glimmers were, well, you could go back to uh, Beron en pin and Heliopolis and even back further, but those were tiny little ventures into converting public land into urban or other uses. Uh, then Sadat came along with his famous October paper which talked about strategic spaces. And that then led to the establishment of the new Urban Communities Authority. And from then on, under Mubarak, uh, there was a succession of new towns and more and more industrial zones and development corridors and massive land agriculture schemes also, which I won't even talk about here, um, and tourist development, which now extends over almost all of Egypt's coastline. And then in 2008, Cairo Strategic Vision for the, aimed at the year 2050, and then under uh, El Sisi, uh, the Egypt Sustainable Development Strategy, 2052, and then the Egypt Strategic Vision of 2030 and in 2015, the establishment of the new administrative capital. So, uh, that's one of the General Organization for Physical Planning's many uh, plans to fill up these empty spaces. I won't go into the details, but there are many, and they are quite uh, ambitious. The special reality is that, in, that 
there is a friction to distance. Main, uh, first of all, in infrastructure costs. I won't go into this. This is what one studies when you're in school, in planning school, that there's a large cost with uh, investing in infrastructure, whether it's water treatment plants, or, uh, transmission mains, or uh, articulated networks, same with electricity, same with uh, <clears throat> uh, sanitation, same with roads, and on and on and on. And there are also recurrent costs. The longer the, the, the line, the more chance it has for leakage, the more power you need to use to pump the water or the sewage or, or uh, transmit the power. Uh, and then there are energy and carbon footprint costs, which are enormous. And Egypt is just beginning to have to accept uh, market prices for uh, natural gas and uh, fuel for cars. And we all know that it is not entered into the calculation uh, the carbon footprint. There are also mobility costs. Workers have to get to work. And this, as you'll see when I talk about industrial areas, is another cost, both direct cost to the company and a cost on the livelihoods of the, of the workers. And then there's a mobility cost in, in transporting goods. You may think it's not much, but it actually is quite a bit. And then there are livelihood costs. You have businesses, social services, and social capital, all of which depend on uh, proximity. And if that proximity is not there, the, these costs all go up, or they just don't develop. And I might point out that new technologies do not erase any of these costs. So my hypothesis is that having infinite space, I don't really mean infinite, because everything's got a limit, but lots of what appears to be infinite in the hand of a government that ignores these costs will compromise its own spatial plans. They don't, the, the cost of distance, the frictions of distance will kill it. It has a distorting effect on the country's main national policies, in this case, urban development, housing, and industrial development, and has a negative impact on economic growth and especially what the World Bank loves to call shared prosperity, which means that normal people benefit, which is part of what you people are talking about. I think you use the word inclusion. Anyway, does Egypt have a land curse? We'll see. So we start off with uh, the new towns. And there are 22 existing new towns. There are seven new towns around Cairo. Uh, you know them all, but there's actually eight if you include as many planners do the 10th of Ramadan. Eight towns. Plus, there are 14 new towns already established elsewhere. And there's the list. And I won't go into them, but you probably know some of them. And they are... And they all have the same features. They're, build, they're planned at, to high standards and low density, and they result in sprawl and patchy development. Uh, any of the compounds that you know about, uh, residential compounds, can only build on 20% of the land. The rest is supposed to be for landscaping, streets, circulations, open spaces, etc. Private housing in the new towns is only affordable by the upper middle class and rich. Um, if you're interested, we could go into that, but I don't have time. Uh, and it has generated a lot of speculative, speculative investment, which had not been planned. Uh, and as a result, empty housing units dominate the new towns at between 60 to 80 percent. Uh, Attempts at affordable social housing have been made, and they're very good. Unfortunately, 
Most of them have been developed in, into monoform housing estates that are quite remote and which to date almost nobody lives in. Earlier housing projects, uh, Mubarak al-Shabaab and other uh, projects uh, actually have filled up, but it takes a long time. Uh, mobility is exclusively by the private car or by minibuses. Uh, the CTA, Cairo Transport Authority, does run some buses out to these new towns, but they're very sparse and don't provide much service. Uh, most of these gated communities are inward oriented. Uh, you've all been out there and you've seen it's just walls and walls and walls. Uh, and no, no street space. All significant commercial, office, and services have, they are, have been successful in these new towns around Cairo, anyway. Uh, there's, but there's little street life and no functioning public spaces except inside malls and shopping centers. So, what happened to the concept of the compact city, which has been talked about for the last 15 or 20 years and has been endorsed by the new urban agenda of UN Habitat, which was in Quito in 2016, it doesn't seem to have had much effect so far in Egypt. Have the new towns in Cairo been successful demographically? Well, uh, I don't know how many people have looked at the detailed results of the 2017 census, uh, but they came out in September 2018, and they are quite remarkable and remarkably ignored. Uh, the population of the eight towns around Cairo, including 10th of Ramadan, increased from 601,000 to 1,298,000, with more than doubling. And they now represent 6% of the population of Greater Cairo. And the highest growth is in 6 October, followed by 10th of Ramadan, followed by New Cairo. Have these eight new towns and their increased population helped reduce population pressures on existing Cairo? Unfortunately, hardly at all. At the same time that these towns doubled in size, Greater Cairo's population grew by 4.9 million people. Only 14 of this increase was absorbed in the new towns, meaning where that 86% were not. Where did the 86% go? Into existing Cairo and mostly informal settlements. All right. Oh, sorry, okay, next one. What about the 14 other towns out, outside Greater Cairo? Um, the, here the, the, the results have been less than spectacular. There has been some population growth, growth and so they absorbed almost 150,000 people uh, in the last 10 years. I can give you lots of examples, but I don't think I have time. I have a whole sheet. Details of the populations of all these different new towns. I'll just, I'll just mention one of them, a couple of them. Yeah. Uh, so Haga Gedida had a population of 57 in 2006, and it went up to 174. Uh, all the new towns in Upper Egypt are not doing well at all. Uh, but for the country as a whole, in 2017, there was a total of 1.68 million people in all the new towns, representing 1.7% of the population of Egypt. And this was, the increase were, represented only 3.8% of Egypt's population increase over that period of 22 million. In other words, at this rate, the new towns will never provide relief to the Nile Valley. It's just impossible because I've calculated that over from 2017 in the next 
10 years, there'll be another 32 to 35 million people in Egypt. And even if the rate goes up uh, to some spectacular 10% of this increase, it will have absolutely no effect on the demography. Speak up, please. OK. Oh, and just to cap this, um, the Newtown phenomenon is, is very land hungry. I'll show you this in a minute. It's all being developed by the new Urban Communities Authority, Hayat al Muqtama'at al Oraniya Gidida, which has a monopoly and it's based on presidential decrees. And none of them have any local administration. They are outside the governorate system. They are administered by NUCA, a central authority. More and more new towns are in the pipeline under the same sort of land extensive development policies. I might point out also under the same physical design parameters. And um, there are 17 new new towns that have been started since 2016 or decreed in the last two years. There are six new towns which are extensions to existing new towns. You have uh, October Gardens and Sphinx Cities, which are extensions to 6th six, to six of October. There's an extension to Sheikh Zayed. There's an extension to El Abour called New El Abour. There's something called South New Cairo, which I couldn't find a map of, but I think it exists, and there's an extension to Nubaria City, totaling at least 500 square kilometers. There are 11 completely new new towns, the most famous being New El Alamein, but there's also Tushka City, East Port Said, West Port Said, El Warak Gedida, New Bir El Abd, in, that's in Sinai, New El Fashion, which is in Asyut, and then Asyut West, New Malawi, Kenna West, and New Luxor, at least 400,000, 400, 400 square kilometers. And uh, I should add, there's also Gebel Galala, an another new city. There they are. Oops, sorry. There they are. Sorry, I didn't show that. Uh, that's just a sort of a... Uh, propaganda picture of New El Alamein, which is 43,000 fedans or 180 square kilometers. But the only part that's really moving is the seven or 10 kilometers sea frontage. Uh, and that's booming. Uh, and, and this shows something important, which I'll get to now when, I'm talk, when I talk about the new ad administrative capital, which is that the new towns, new development has become uh, completely uh, uh, commodified. Land has been commodified, and it's, and it's a financial issue right now. And that's why it, I think it, it continues. So part two, new administrative capital. I'll try to zoom along here. Um, everybody knows about it. It's uh, occupied the news for a long time. Uh, and it's, it's the extreme use of limitless space, 714 square kilometers, which is larger than built up Cairo with 19 million inhabitants. It's an extreme eastward expansion of <coughs> Cairo's desert footprint. Forget the west extension. It takes the D Dubai model to an extreme and is seen as a vehicle for both domestic and foreign investment and as a way to reform central government and isolate it and another way to ignore all that is old and, problem and problematic. David, can you use the microphone, please? Sorry. Sorry. OK. But it starts to echo. Anyway, uh, this is one of the uh, 
Im images, which is constantly used about New Cairo, and uh, sorry, the new administrative capital, and it shows a perfect sort of uh, occupation of empty space. Here it is. The blue is the uh, boundary of New Cairo, uh, the new administrative capital, and the red is phase one. But if you look at it, this is just to show you what's, what it means by limitless space. Here we have uh, what is already either, uh, has already been built or planned. So, sorry, we have we have here New Cairo, you all know it. We have here uh, Shuruk. We have here New Heliopolis. We have here El Badr. And we have here Future City. And we have here um, the Ministry of Defense. These are all under construction. At least half the land, if not more, has been sold. And as you can see, it's creating what will be uh, eastward mega sprawl. Uh, there will be over, when you j add just those things together, you will have well over 1,500 square kilometers. Uh, which is larger than New York, uh, uh, larger than Los Angeles, and twice the size of New York. And there's more to come. Inevitably, well, the other empty spaces will quickly be filled up, uh, and it's going to create a continuous, underutilized landscape, which will have huge environmental, water, and energy ramifications and high associated operations and maintenance costs forever. The question is, who's going to pay for those? Anyway, the Dubai parallel is quite appropriate for many reasons. Endless land for expansion, signature iconic architecture, high tech and smart digital city, um, specialized isolated enclaves or cité, so we have medical, media, culture, each one separate, entertainment, adventure, education, knowledge, sports, finance, etc. Uh, it is mainly a vehicle for attracting, or partly a vehicle for attracting foreign investment and businesses. And there are lots uh, of private and international schools, uh, not a single public school. Uh, 68 have been approved so far. And even to the extent of how you get people to pay for this, when you buy a property in the new town or in, any, uh, in, in the new capital or any of the new towns, you do what they do in, in Dubai. You ask for a series of upfront post-dated checks so that if you don't pay, you go to jail. So you see the, the Dubai parallel is quite interesting, but it's a full parallel. Why? Uh, so far, there have been no m significant Gulf investments, and the Chinese are very timid and are uh, using, uh, based all their, they are not partners, they, are, they are, have advanced loans which will have to be repaid. Unlike the UAE, the Egyptian state does not have limitless funds, especially to hire the kind of expertise and global management services which enable Dubai to run. And it, Basically, it will never become a city-state regional destination and business-friendly hub that is Dubai. There are no taxes in Dubai, so that is one difference. Uh, it is interesting that uh, there is an idea of using space to reform the bureaucracy. Uh, only the top layers of government agencies are going to go there, the Diwan and the Safatani, as they say. Uh, uh, they, they must be English speaking and digitally sav savvy. And so far, they have, uh, the, in the press, they have said 150,000 in all, which helps because they hope to. Uh, 
Can I ask people to check that their phones are off, please? This is the third time. Thank okay. you. Uh, <clears throat> I also should point out that uh, the new administrative capital, and especially the Hayat Hukumi, will be bracketed on one side by the presidency and on the other by the ministry, ministry of Defense. And it will be sanitized by distance. Uh, embassies also. As somebody wrote just recently, last week, uh, uh, this is somebody in construction research and innovation who wrote, perhaps the new capital is not intended for the Egyptian people to escape the country's geographical constraints as much it is for the Egyptian government to escape its people. I didn't say that. Uh, so, moving on here. Wait, what happened there? Yeah. Well, it ignores pretty much the majority. We won't go into that. But we, I do want to say the commodification, commodification of public land, uh, it's, a, it's a successful financial model. Uh, you sell large chunks of serviced land, vaguely serviced, to private developers who then build mostly residential units and, and they all talk about integrated development now, so they all have some commercial and office space and lots of uh, landscaping. Uh, to whom? Mostly to Egyptian families. Okay, the businesses, some businesses, but the the, way, the, the model is successful because they sell to it, Egyptian families uh, and it is a profitable safe haven for family wealth, wealth as well as a vehicle for speculation. Uh, more than one developer has estimated that their sales are 80% for speculation investment and only 20% for, for a home. Uh, administra these are the, the, the base uh, raw or gross administrated land prices are ever upward, and that's due to Nuka, who has to finance uh, these developments. So we had in 2009, the famous uh, a couple plots of land went for 4,500 pounds a square meter in New Cairo. One of the, one of the ones who purchased it was the brother of Gaddafi. In 2018, um, the Ministry of Housing is buying from the company that, that is developing the new capital land to then sell on or to allocate for various purposes at 15,000 pounds per square meter gross. And this year, it was announced that in one development, Taj City, which is near, uh, which is under the Nasser City development, uh, a developer paid 55,000 pounds per square meter for one fedan. So you can see. Anyway, Nuka has become all powerful because of this financial uh, model, and the armed forces has also entered in big time. So, and one presumes, a new, and the new administrative capital takes this model, which is in the new towns also, to a new level, and seems to be working as long as demand continues. I go to industrial zones, which is probably pretty boring for most of you, but it's very important. Why? Uh, a strong, com uh, yeah, <sighs> a strong competitive and productive manufacturing. Uh, sector is really Egypt's only hope. It's not me. Many many economists have said Egypt has to uh, can, cannot rely on tourism, cannot rely on agriculture, cannot rely on just being its geographic location. It has to get its industry moving. But to date, the res the record is frankly abysmal. There are few dynamic subsectors, few exports, many lost niches. Uh, but there have been some success in intermediate goods, basically in chemicals, petrochemicals, building materials, plastics, and steel. But that hasn't provided enough of a base. And most of that is consumed domestically. 
manufacturing as a share of GDP and of the labor force has been declining set steadily for at least the last 20 years. The sector has no depth. In most subsectors, half of raw materials and half of in intermediate goods which are needed for, for manufacturing are imported. And so is all machinery. Uh, this showed up when over 4,000 factories were said to have closed after the devaluation of the Egyptian pound because all their inputs doubled in price. Uh, there are just simply few forward or backward linkages, unlike Turkey, China, Vietnam, and South Korea, for example. So the solution seems to be more industrial zones. And most of these are unsuitable, poorly serviced, and largely empty. Uh, yes, the government has struggled to create more uh, favorable investment policies, good regional roads and ports, and that's a big plus. But there seems to be an overriding obsession with simply creating more industrial land, uh, larger and larger, and in more and more remote areas. Uh, and plus, the might mention the rollout of other land-hungry zones as logistics centers, dry ports, warehousing complexes, free zones, you name it. And in this, Ida, you all know Ida? Nobody knows Ida. Industrial Development Authority leads the way. <clears throat> um, there, uh, Ida gained control over all industrial zones and land sales in 2016, a new law, except for Gaffey's. Uh, it used to be the governor at Sanuka, and Ida uh, was given complete control over the administration and land sales in these zones, and also it gained in 2018 independence from the Ministry of Industry and Trade. Uh, thus, financially, it is a mega land developer. Uh, it, because it has financial independence, it really wants to make money. And how does it do it? It sells land. Uh, it has accelerated development of new zones and land sales. Uh, it claimed to have <coughs> developed 11 million square meters, which is 110 square kilometers in 2016, and another 49 million, 40, uh, 49 million square meters by 2020. And it has been trumpeting Egypt's second largest industrial zone in the Fayum, which I cannot find. But it has also uh, been developing SME, uh, small and medium enterprise factory spaces. And I'll show that. Coming along, Gaffey is close behind. Gaffey, you know Gaffey? General authority for investments and free zones. That's been around for a long time. There are nine existing zones. It's under the Ministry of Investment and International Cooperation. There are nine existing zones. You can see them there. And at least 19 more are planned as of 2018, sprinkled all over the country. Again, there is as much warehousing, distribution, and logistics as manufacturing in these zones. But it sounds like they're just going to create more. There are all, there's also a new fashion, which has started in 2002 with the Chinese the Tianjin Economic Development Area, that's in Ein Sochna. Uh, they were allocated 7.3 square kilometers, an enormous piece of land, of which they only use 1.3 square kilometers, and only part of that. Okay, that's existing plan. We have, you've all heard of the Russian industrial zone, that's going to be in East Port Said on 5.2 square kilometers. <coughs> the uh, China textile city on 3.1 square kilometers in Sadat City. There's supposed to be a Chinese, uh, sorry, a Japanese industrial zone of the same size somewhere in the, in, in the Suez Canal zone. There's supposed to be a Turkish engineering zone in 10th of Rabanan or Badr. A South Korean zone, huge one in Ataka, that's south of Suez, or Sadat City. There's also supposed to be a German auto city somewhere. These are all f from the news. This is all from what has been reported in the press. 
cheap land and complicated permanent inspection regimes are what makes for dead or almost dead industrial zones. Uh, it's sold between 500 and 700 pounds a square meter, which is very cheap, and you have extended payment peri periods. In Upper Egypt, it's free. But there are very burdensome approval systems that try to attract serious investors. The famous Tazbit al which has been going on for at least 30 years, and they never seem to get it right. Uh, to dampen, uh, they try to dampen land speculation and force compliance. Approvals are needed at every stage, and uh, there are penalties. Well, uh, it's, it just results in sparsely used sites, bad or non-existent infrastructure, and it is inescapable to, assume, to conclude that a lot of this is land speculation again. And that has been reinforced by periodic warnings by both Ida and the Suez Canal Zone and Gafi. And last month, the Prime Minister was in Ein Silchna, again, warning investors that they better get their projects going. But it has little or no effect. Or else they'll say they'll take back the land. But in a lot of cases, the walls have been built. built. Something has been invested in there. And how do you take back that? In other words, and they're, they're investors, usually uh, prominent investors, Egyptian investors, and it just doesn't seem to happen very often. So, here we go. <clears throat> I won't go into the Gaffey control regime, uh, these two decrees that just came out. If you read them, you'll, you'll, you'll understand what I'm saying. But even SME support, everyone recognizes that SMEs are the key to industrial deepening and to generating employment. There are lots of incentives. There's an, an, a significant amount of money has been allocated for loans for, for SMEs. New SME law just passed this last week. The aim is to formalize and tax these small factories and businesses, but it's, it's, it's very difficult. Small and medium enterprises. I already said that small, medium enterprises. Those are the ones that are mostly illegal right now, or let's say vaguely registered, and, and they employ, if you include small, very small enterprises, they, they employ probably 60% 60, 60 of the Egyptian labor force. Of course, there's double accounting there because some people work in the government and in these industries, but anyway. Um, these are key, and the government has done a lot for it. But to, it, this is, doesn't seem to generate for much real uh, growth of these small industries, partly due to a reluctance on the part of owners to come under the eye of government bureaucrats. But another reason is that virtually all locations, all zones that have been sanctioned for these small industries are either in the new towns or other remote sites. And this is the last. It's a, it seems to be lost opportunities. I won't go into it, but as 30 years ago, almost 30 years ago, there was an attempt to get the, uh, a factory in Basatin who had been empty it had been a Czech leather factory, public sector, to carve it up and use it for small, uh, small enterprises. Why? Because there's a million, there are a million people who live within three kilometers of that factory. Um, go there today. It is still exactly the way it was 30 years ago. I could go on and on. The Moharam Bay factory complex, examples in Abu Rawash, which are a little further out of town, Abadeya, Ismailia, but they all sort of don't really work. Then there's the SME uh, cluster in 6th of October, which has been widely hailed as a success, but I went there and I couldn't find hardly anything operating. There's the uh, Industrial Development Authority has a zone, uh, SME zone in Badr, again, very far away. 
and Sadat City, again, very far away. There have been, or there's one or two uh, small industry built factory developers. Uh, Polaris is a Turkish Saudi company uh, in, and has built something in 6th of October in Port Said, but these are too large, too expensive, and too remote. Are they creating jobs? Cheap, Egypt should be use its comparative advantage, which is cheap and relatively educated labor. But location matters and industrial areas are remote from labor pools. Think of any, any industrial area and you'll find that no one lives nearby. Uh, plus there's another problem of trying to get uh, workers to these factories. You're talking about a two to four hour per day commute on a bus for a job which is horribly underpaid. Thus, most companies prefer capital intensive machines ready to go imported inputs, and there are few attempts to upgrade their labor themselves because they don't need it, except for a few managers. In other words, the obsession with creating industrial space crowds out other industrial policy. Uh, both Ida and Gaffey do make attempts to streamline approvals, one-stop shop, simplified licensing, but investors still complain endlessly, as does the World Bank. Service factory units might help if they were in the right location, but they're not. The so it seems the only consistent policy <coughs> is to show that more and more industrial space is being created. Somehow, another few million square meters here and another few million square meters there uh, uh, expresses success. So, conclusion. Pretty short. <coughs> in, in my view, the preoccupation with carving out ever more space, desert space, public space, allows the government to manufacture more dreams of modernity to generate revenues and to ignore the, the real problems, which are very difficult, which face the majority. This infinite space has distorted national strategies uh, affecting housing, housing, urban development, and manufacturing. <coughs> Think of Turkey, South Korea, China, you name it. All have had to deal with confined and privately owned hinterlands, and though not perfect, their governments have delivered prosperity to the majority. So, I'll leave you with a question. Can a land curse be as debilitating and rent-creating as a natural resources cur uh, curse? Thanks. Uh. Thank you everyone again for being here and I apologize for the fact that there aren't enough seats. Next time we have uh, David, we'll move it to Ewart Hall. Um, at this point, uh, David will be taking questions. We will take one question at a time. Please raise your hand and someone is going to pass the microphone to you. But please be considerate of the fact that we only have uh, limited time, a lot of people. So be uh, brief, precise, and kindly introduce yourself again very briefly. One last time, if you have your phones on, kindly switch them off or put them on silent. Hiba uh, Saleh? Can you hear me? Yes. David, I just want to ask if you can think of any conditions under which a new city would be successful in Egypt, or is it just impossible? Well, uh, location, location, location. If, I wouldn't say cities, I would say accretions or extensions onto cities which are close by existing labor pools, uh, existing infrastructure, and which can be easily integrated into the urban fabric, 
and I have lots of examples of public land that are still, it is our, uh, pieces of public land, quite large ones, which are still available around great, in and around Greater Cairo, which would be perfect. But these are not being even considered. Next question. Uh, yes, B back there. Hello, David. Um, oh. uh, hi, David. My name is Ahmed Zaza. Um, I have one question, but it's it's actually split into two parts. So um, uh, I think that when for the new new cities, they failed in attracting um, what was needed uh, as as population, as inhabitants, to inhabit the new, the new cities. Correct me if I'm wrong, the, the target was uh, in 2006 that all the new cities would inhabit around 3.6 million inhabitants. And as you showed, they didn't even uh, reach one quarter of this target. And in 2017, again, it's again, it's failing in attracting the inhabitants. So what kind of um, economic model for lots of invest investors that they are still investing in the new capital? What uh, it's clearly there is no end user is being like to sell to the end user. It's between investor to, to another investor and so on. So this is the first part. The second part is actually concerning the uh, corporate uh, position in the new capital. Again, there is a strategic conflict between what's happening in the new capital Cairo and what's happening in downtown. They are now they they tore down Maspiru to build uh, t uh, gl uh, towers. Mostly, to, uh, a huge chunk of them they will be offices. Again, what's happening? What will happen in Mbeba? What will happen in the islands? Apart, of course, from the rest of 2050 plan, what will happen in Hel in Helwan and uh, and Ain Jums? So exactly. The, the, the corporates, would they uh, direct their investments in the new capital Cairo or in um, downtown? So Thank you. The, so the state, do they have a plan for this or no? Thank you. Well, <clears throat> to answer the first part of the question, I said this. It's this financial model which seems to be working, which is based largely on speculative investment in real estate. And somebody else said, in Egypt, you don't need banks because you've got real estate. And it's like you can get a better return by buying early into one of these things and waiting for a while and selling it. Whether this continues is another subject. But the financial model seems to be working. Um, and there's no, I might point out, there's absolutely no <coughs> monitoring of this market. The, it's all uh, just enthusiastic, optimistic uh, pronouncements of individual uh, real estate developers. And their, I call them their pilot fish of uh, those who are uh, uh, real estate brokers and real estate agents. OK, so that's the model. And it's working very well. And that explains the new towns around Cairo by the way, they don't work at all elsewhere in the new towns. Uh, and it also explains the new capital. But then you said, but do you think developers might are either or? No, it's plus plus. Uh, developers never, it, it's a land bonanza. It seems to be an endless land bonanza. And there are investments in existing Cairo uh, also for exactly the same market, speculative mostly. High-end luxury investment, uh, whether it's residential, uh, service, or commercial. So don't worry. There'll be some, uh, I think Maspiro will get filled up <laughs> at some point. Uh, I'll take one question from here. Uh, yes, back here, Chris. 
Hello, my name's Chris Barker, political science, new here, although I've been reading your books. And my question is about uh, in the intentions that we may or may not impute to planners. In other words, is there someone actually planning all of this? Uh, can we talk about the intentions at the agency level or the intentions of government? And with respect to who's being blinded by these dreams uh, of the desert imperative, uh, would that include uh, the Egyptian people investing, or are you primarily referring to the government uh, blinded by uh, its own dreams? Thank you. I would say the, the if you want to call it blindness or <clears throat> over-enthusiasm is another way to put it, um, it's mostly, uh, it's government, uh, and it's uh, What's interesting is behind the government, all of these plans, some of the early ones were actually drawn up by uh, GOPP and some of the others. But most of them are uh, uh, consultants. Almost all these plans are made by consultants whose main business has been in the Gulf. So you have this, I call it the, this transfer of a, of a Gulf, Saudi, UAE, you name it, Qatar, Kuwait, everybody. Many Egyptian professionals have gained their experience and made their money and are teaching at universities using the models they have used and, and the developments they have produced for the Gulf to their students. So there's a, it's not just the government, and it's not just the businessman. There's a, there's a, I would call it the, the, the professional class is also uh, enamored with this same land is endless. We just take a blank piece of paper and we're gonna draw on it and then uh, we're gonna add the latest thing. Oh, what did they do in Dubai? Oh, they've got a Ferris wheel, we need a Ferris wheel. We have a tall building. We need a tall building, and and so there's. It's much more complex than just uh, uh, government professionals, um, and I know many of them. It's the investors. It's the professional classes, and who is buying a lot of these properties, especially the gated communities? It is Egyptians who either are in the Gulf and are making enough money to actually pay, uh, meet the eight-year installment payments for these things, or they were in the Gulf. And they have acquired not only uh, capital, family capital, but they've also acquired the lifestyle which is in the Gulf. We were talking about compounds, and what do you do when you're bored? You go shopping, you go to a mall, you might go to a, have a little run on a ski lift. In other words, it has, what I see is it's been much more, it's, it's, it's much more nuanced than, than, than one would have thought. Largely due to the fact that a big section of Egyptian society, upper class society, has made their way through the Gulf. Hope that helps. Okay. Four, fourth row here, please. Yes. Hi, um, Habib Al Kharbutli. I just wanted to ask you with regards to, um, with regards to the financial um, advantages and benefits that Nuka get and other entities in government. I want to ask you about your opinion with regards to um, contractors, whether they're private or public contractors, and the influence and benefit that they get out of this too. I don't know. Um, I would forgot to add that there's the professional class, there's the developer class, which is also a professional class. Most developers started off, or many of them started off, as uh, uh, engineering firms, design firms, architectural design firms. But you're right. Contractors are another, a lot of them also. As a matter of fact, a lot of developers are contractors and they give jobs to themselves. So the contractors are another group of cheerleaders. They make money out of this. Uh, the government, uh, NUCA uses private contractors, 
State contractors, of course. Who's building the downtown of uh, the new capital? It's Arab contractors. But it also uses the army, and it uses army contractors. So everybody's in it. It's a, it, in a way, it's a wonderful model. I saw a hand here. Yes, back there, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mustafa Nassar. I'm an architect. Uh, does modern technology have anything to do with this whole thing? Can uh, applying modern technologies such as drones analysis or uh, any urban tools can be can be useful? Like softwares like City Energy Analyst or anything can be helpful in any way of engaging in this problem, or the urban issue is on a side, it's only about political decisions? Thank you. Well, uh, it's, it's not just political decisions, it's, it's, it's financial decisions. And uh, you see, uh, uh, if you've been following, I think you probably have, around the world, uh, smart cities and digital cities and uh, you can <clears throat> security cities uh, have become quite a thing. In terms of analysis, they don't need any analysis. Uh, uh, there's no information out there anyway. Uh, if they actually found out how many units are coming on the market every year and how many are actually being inhabited, they might, it might actually cause a, a certain reluctance to continue this model, but there isn't. There's uh, the most simple tools. Try to find out how many units have been sold in the last year in the new capital. You can't. The, they say 70% of the land is sold, and they say that we are eventually going to build, I forget how many, uh, 100,000 units in phase one. But that's not, those aren't figures. Those are just sort of markers. I, I, uh, I would like to see the government uh, to establish what many countries have, which is uh, housing and real estate uh, monitoring um, unit, which pr will publish uh, uh, statistics, which uh, developers and others will have to report to. That would be the first step. You don't need high tech for that. Uh, yes, back there. Uh, my name is Karim Farah, I'm a sustainability consultant, and I'm uh, sad to, to hear what you have to say. I thought that there was something, it was being cooked very quickly, but I didn't know the extent of damage that it might cause. So my question is, how come nobody in the government has this information? Is it possible that haven't you talked to anybody? Has, hasn't anybody seen these statistics? And my other question, is there any, uh, as an optimistic Egyptian, is there any chance that uh, these things might end up well after all? Have a good ending somehow? Okay. Uh, first question is, uh, doesn't anybody know these statistics? Well, most of my statistics are from the census. CAPMAS, government. Government doesn't follow those statistics. As, as far as I know, it's only me and a couple other people who have actually looked at the detailed uh, Qism and Shiacha results of the census to figure out how many people are in these new towns. Uh, the government will say, uh, the prime minister said last year that there are six million, or is it seven million, people living in the new towns. There are 1.6 million, according to the census. But they'll say, oh no, we have our own statistics, which are based on water connections or electrical connections. And they count them up and they say, multiply by 4.5, and you end up with the population. So uh, it's not like this is, it's hidden in plain sight. The, all of my figures on the hundreds and thousands of square kilometers of land which is, are supposed to be, are being, or are supposed to be developed, they come from, uh, uh, from uh, 
El más frío yo, or a good one is uh, Enterprise, they're, they're pretty good. Or uh, any of uh, the Egypt Daily News, even the Egyptian Gazette. I mean, it's out there, uh, but it, it's hard to pick it all up because a lot of these, this media is uh, <clears throat> just private developers saying how good they're doing. So will it ever, second part of your question is, will this ever have a happy ending? Well, uh, it certainly doesn't create many jobs. Uh, even the government seems to be focused on the million, or is it two million jobs that are being created in construction. You hardly develop an economy on, a, on construction labor. Uh, otherwise, uh, maybe it's not so bad because it's a lot of lost, or not lost, but uh, dead capital out there. And it'll just sit gathering dust. But maybe at some point uh, a little reality will come in and there will be a shift back to uh, trying to develop services and industry where the people live. But it's not a, it, today it's not a good scenario. Uh, architect Tom Rauf. Uh, according to statis statistics, there are 12 million uh, closed apartments. 13 million. 13. Thir 13. Okay. <laughs> 13 million closed apartments. And the prices are still going up. Yeah. So my question, where is this, when this bubble will explode and the prices will go down? Uh, there's no bubble in Egypt? Please. Ishaat. <laughs> Ishaat. Fakat. But uh, I, I would point out that uh, empty or closed <clears throat> units or almost finished units are very common even in uh, Ashwai areas. It's not just a phenomenon in, in the new towns. It's just a particularly acute problem in the new towns. So some areas like uh, even Bulat Dakrur or uh, El Omoraneya will have 30% or 40% empty or almost finished or it's very hard to calculate because you can see it. You'll see a 15-story building and there's one or two of the lower floors seem to be inhabited but the upper floors are, don't even have their windows. And then some poor guy on the 12th floor is trying to make a go. <clears throat> and that's because there's no lift. But that's another story. We could talk about the progressive occupation of 15-story buildings. And that's a wonderful story, which somebody should take up. Uh, um, hi, my name is Iman. OK, my name is Iman Faru. Um, I have one question. What, like, it seems that the government and the investors have so much incent incentives to work in this direction, but what could be uh, other incentives to reverse this, like to make them more work more in uh, labor concentrated areas or so on? So what could be the invest uh, incentives for NUCA and others to, to invest back into the city or in already built areas, not in new ones? Uh, well, I don't know. The, <clears throat> I understand Nuka is a party to the Maspero Triangle. Yeah, and they were they have an interest in the Mbaba Airport area, and they are more and more becoming just a general uh, a, a a state developer. Um, <clears throat> but like I said to another question, it's and and, no one's going to stop. I can't think of incentives that could be used short of uh, a redrafting of, let's say, the uh, strategy for Greater Cairo, which would be to use some of the precious underutilized and unused areas in and around Greater Cairo, and they are mostly 
uh, state security, dead public sector companies, or army uh, uh, sites, which could very much be used to provide the lacking services and other activities which are needed in especially near to very dense informal areas. Uh, but I just don't see it. As a matter of fact, it's going the other way. With the IPOs, the uh, privatization of more public sector fac firms, uh, they are sitting on good land, good land assets, de de warehousing, factories, this Bassatine factory I'm telling you about. And I just read the other day, how is the uh, Egyptian Iron and Steel Company going to settle all their debts? They're going to sell all their land. And to what? To developers to develop more luxury housing in Helwan, in Maadi, in Khalifa, and in other areas. In other words, even the few opportunities that could exist and could become incentive because they're state land, uh, are rapidly disappearing. Okay, um, I'm Bafi Aouf, uh, I'm a director for Applied Studies Department in uh, the AC here. Uh, I have two questions actually. Uh, the first one is, uh, um, in 2008, there was the financial crisis, and uh, the real estate was a player, a, a major player in the financial crisis, uh, which happened in 2008, which affected the United States and uh, uh, Dubai and all the area. So how far are we from such situation? Are we approaching the same scenario, or we are in the safe uh, area yet? This is the, my first question. The second question is related to the uh, SMEs and the industry. Um, what's a potential solution for uh, developing the industry in uh, in the Egyptian in the Egyptian market? I mean, uh, especially that uh, uh, for SMEs, there is one of the solutions that to have a major uh, industry park where SMEs are the supplier for such park. And I believe that so far, uh, until now we don't have this major uh, industry park. Thank you. Okay, the first one, luckily I don't even have to answer that one because almost every developer when asked will say the same thing. No, no, no. The, the, Egypt does not have a problem because there are no mortgages. And it's true. You don't have this cascade of, of financial disaster, banks failing, uh, recombined packaged securities failing because one after the other goes because you, there's, there's no uh, uh, foreclosure. You just sit. If you can't pay, if, pay for it, you just sit on it and somebody else will come. So yes, I agree with them in this case. Egypt is not exposed uh, as was California and the rest of the United States and Europe. Second part of the question. Uh, that, I'm sorry. Oh, SMEs. Yes, I, SMEs are supposed to be uh, uh, feeder industries for the big guys. But the big guys are so uh, uh, stuck uh, on importation, uh, and there's no attempts to upgrade the SME uh, small <coughs> industries, their their quality, and it's the wrong location. If there had could be and I have been part of studies since the 90s which say Greater Cairo does not have a single place where you have, uh, uh, you could rent a industrial, a small factory site which has all of its utilities and all of its permits. And if you had that, and even if it were at first subsidized, I think you would start to see this starting to happen because then you could, they would be near the labor pool. They would be near the informal word of mouth markets. They would be near, uh, uh, they could access the kind of technology they need. Um, but, well, let's hope. Uh, just a 
in case you're interested uh, for more about investment in SMEs, on April 23rd, we, our lecture will be uh, dedicated to Egypt's investment dilemma, and our lecturer will be Dr. Ziad Behaeddin, who used to be uh, Vice Prime Minister and the head of Gafi. Uh, here, and then Mohammed, yes, the gentleman. No, 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 you, yes. Both of you. Uh, Patrick Wurr from Reuters. Um, already there's been a huge amount of investment in the new capital and a huge amount of prestige has been put into it. Now suppose you were appointed advisor to the people developing the new capital. What would you tell them to do that, or urge them to do to make it thrive? To make the... I don't know. It's a bit, it's a bit late. I mean... Uh, if they had simply started with a core and got it going, made deals with people that would actually build on time and maybe <clears throat> give them additional incentives, get the core working, get five ministries, not all 40 working, get, <clears throat> you don't need an opera, you don't need, but get a functioning core city working with some transport, public transport, and then sit there and wait. And then you could expand outward and make a lot of money. And so there, because there is potential, because if you're gonna put the government there, you've got, it has a sort of captive market, so to speak. But they didn't do that. They're now already selling an R7, which is the fifth residential zone. The last one, I mean, they are, they were supposed to just do R3. R3 isn't even finished yet. Not a single person lives there. And won't be finished until next year. And now they've got R5, R6, R7. In other words, they're spread out. Take, take a simple example. You've all, if you've been there, you've probably seen the cathedral. Well, the cathedral is a huge project. And then around it is supposed to be even more. But if you go to Google Earth and then zoom out, it's lost in no time at all into the desert again. Everything gets lost in the desert. And that's not, from a pure real estate point of view, that's not good for business. You've got too many things going on. It's going to be a construction site forever. So that, was, that would be my advice, but it's, it's a bit late. Um, thank you, Mr. David. Uh, my question is about the disastrous uh, Delta urban expansion uh, last uh, few years on the expense of agricultural lands where villages develop into poorly serviced uh, small cities. In your opinion, what is the best way to accommodate growing population in Delta where you can't build a close by uh, extension or new cities? Uh, because it uh, eat our agricultural lands. Yes. Oh, well, that's a that's a big problem, uh, and and you're right. The delta is under lots of urbanization pressures. Just call them village expansion pressures. It's it's a serious problem, and it's eating up agricultural land. I wouldn't know what to do because, at the same time, people there are finding housing solutions that they cannot find anywhere else. They cannot find them in public housing projects in their own cities, they don't exist, and they can't find them in the desert. Uh, supposedly, Sadat City is supposed to absorb everybody from Manufaya. <coughs> Tent of Ramadan is supposed to absorb everybody from Shar'eya. Uh, then there's New Mansura, <coughs> which is a, which is a, a seems to be more a uh, coastal, coastal resort. Same with El Alamein. <coughs> Good question, I have no answer. I want to ask you if there is a way to ask Arabic. I want to ask you if there is a way to ask Arabic. So if there is I'm going to ask the same question that has been asked here, but for Cairo. Is Cairo still 
savable or is it خلاص, out of uh, what is the price what do we need to do if we want to have better better flow in Cairo city well that has <clears throat> that has many dimensions I don't think Cairo is uh, going to collapse. As a matter of fact, I don't think it's doing so bad. Uh, because it has, ever since I've lived here, people have made their way and stumbled on. And I think that will continue. So I don't think it's... But when you say flow, yes. Uh, the traffic's just going to get worse. <laughs> And worse, and worse, and worse. And there's no solution except for the metro and other grade separated, uh, separated public transport. And there are some ideas, but it's just so slow. But even, even that is, has its will, something will happen. And, but it will probably not be government policy which pushes it on. Uh, Nadim. Thank you. Uh, Adham Nadim, uh, you have rightly uh, stated that the real estate bubble here is different than elsewhere, and uh, it could be a delayed uh, uh, scenario, and uh, the elite are either losing some money or delaying profits. But what about the uh, social bubble that's going to explode? From your studies, can you... Uh, anticipate where and when it will happen? Uh, social bubble? You mean people get upset? <laughs> well, they already did. It didn't help. The, uh, I don't know. I'm, um, I'm certainly not a, I'm not a sociologist nor a political scientist, and I don't think any of them have any good answers either. Uh, <clears throat> so far, uh, you can thank the informal sector. To house these people, the vast majority, and now uh, it's getting expensive, but yes, you can thank the informal sector for providing jobs. And that, uh, and that will continue, and that will moderate any tendencies towards social bubbles. Uh, back there? Thank you. Hi, I'm Mr. David. My name is Abdullah Saeed. I'm uh, an architect. Architect, okay. Uh, I'm working in an uh, urban development company. I want your advice. If, if, one minute. If there is an urban development company construct, constructing a new city, What's your advice for them to create a complete successful city? I don't know. I was approached a few years ago by the Medinat Nasser company. Uh, it's a public sector company which is, is on the stock market now. And they have a, a wonderful fillet of land. It's now called Taj city, uh, just near the airport. And that would have been, could have been, because the location's not bad. If the location's not bad, you could have thought of some interesting solutions. And they said that's what they wanted. They wanted a mix. They didn't want the same sterile, uh, uh, uniform, luxury market, et cetera, et cetera. But from what I understand of their De, uh, project designs now, they've basically uh, emulated and repeated the same formula that seems to work, which is high-end units. Uh, there was an idea they're going to go down market. You know how they're going down market? They're going more for flats, uh, apartments. But apartments of what? They say 150 to 300 square meters, but most of them are in the 200 to 300 square meter range, which is hardly something that's going to attract uh, a large chunk of society. Well, I don't know. Hello, David. 
Excuse me for my not good uh, English, so I will formulate my uh, question in Arabic, please. Can I? Okay. Uh, الاستثمار في المساكن في مصر تحول من بناء مساكن للاحتياجات إلى استثمار أو ممكن نقول إن هو أصبح نهاية مسدودة للاستثمار. يمكن يكون بسبب عدم وجود وسيلة أخرى للاستثمار أو مجال آخر للاستثمار وبالتالي بيحط الأموال المتوفرة مع الأسرة في مسكن على سبيل الادخار وليس على سبيل السكن وبالتالي حضرتك قلت أن في 13 مليون وحدة سكنية شاغرة ومع ذلك أسعار العقارات في المدن الحالية مدن القائمة مدن الدلتا بالتحديد ما زالت في ارتفاع رغم أن فائد رأس المال غالبه بيروح للمدن الجديدة لشراء عقارات في المدن الجديدة إلا أن ما زال الاستثمار العقاري موجود في المدن القائمة في الدلتا الأسعار بتزيد اللي أقصده من الموضوع الاستثمار بهذا الشكل الاستثمار للاستثمار بيخلق مساكن لطبقة الأغنياء الطبقة فوق المتوسطة والثرية طيب إيه الحلول اللي ممكن يتخذها الطبقات الأقل دون المتوسط والفقير عشان يوفر له وحدات سكنية في المناخ الاستثماري الحالي والله في الوضع الحالي ما فيش حل أنا حضرتك شرحت جيد جدا إن 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 المدخرات الأهلية في مصر بتروح لأعلى ربح مش ربح هو استثمار في المدى المتوسط أو الطويل وهو المدن الجديدة أو ابن عمارة في في منصورة في المنصورة هم هم كلهم ما بين 15 و 20 دور وهتكسب هتكسب البنوك شهادات استثمار بيدي لك ايه 15% مع تضخم 12% رسمي استثمارات في المشاريع الانتاجيه مصانع بس استثمارات في البورصه <تصفيق> يبقى في ايه تاني يعني انا عارف عائلات بيستثمروا في في العقارات بيستثمروا في الاراضي وهو وبيسقعوا بيستثمر في تبني مدرسه لغات في الف طريقه أشياء. بس بي دايما بيوزع فلوسهم في كذا حاجة آه والجزء الأكبر بيروح للأقارات دايما وأنا مش يعني مش شايف أي سياسة حكومية اللي ممكن يتوجه هذه الاستثمارات للمشاريع إنتاجية Thank you very much for your presentation. My name is Huda Yusuf, I'm an economist. Um, my question is, you mentioned several times in your presentation um, the lack of um, pub, uh, social housing, the lack of transportation, the lack of public schools in these new cities. Do you think that if the government uh, starts to think about making these new cities more affordable for the vast majority of the population, can it work? Can it work in attracting uh, more inhabitants? Is that the shift that the, the government needs to think about to make it work? Thank you. Well, unfortunately, they have tried. <laughs> the uh, uh, social housing program, Sandu Iskan uh, Iktimai, is building hundreds of thousands of housing units in the new towns, and they are more or less affordable. <laughs> If you qualify, but they're in the they're, they're, you can't make a livelihood, even if you're in one, <coughs> and can afford the 20-year uh, uh, mortgage payments. 
There's no way, first of all, there are no jobs out there. Even if you have a job, you need a second job. Where are you going to find the second job? You cannot even open a kiosk. You cannot, uh, 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 if there, who's going to take your taxi if you drive one? You have to go into town. In other words, there's a whole complex of uh, the Egyptian urban or even village economy which doesn't exist in those towns. And one of them is social capital. If you ask anybody in Cairo or almost any city or any village, they get their job through other people they know, they uh, become a supplier to somebody, they use somebody as a transporter. None of these things really exists, exist in the new towns. So uh, study after study has shown that unless you can somehow uh, uh, transport the social glue. Uh, for example, very simple. You want to buy a flat in one of the uh, uh, social housing units, or estates. Um, you have absolutely no choice about who your neighbor is. It's by list. So you're going to end up with people you don't know in your building and in the whole neighborhood, maybe by luck. Uh, you know someone from your village, Aslan Yani, who lives in the same area. Whereas if you're going to go and find a flat in an informal area, you will know very well who your neighbors are. Because you will ask. As a matter of fact, you probably are going to be living next to your brother or your uncle or your cousin. That's what I mean about social glue. So it, they've tried it. They, uh, there are lots of public schools out there. As a matter of fact, the ratio of public, uh, uh, the uh, <clears throat> per classroom, uh, uh, students per classroom in the new towns is wonderful. It's, it's low. That's because they built the schools. No, there are no kids. So it's not. It's not just a mechanical thing of well, we'll supply more schools and we're going to have training uh, and we're going to put on a few. Uh, uh, bus lines. Uh, it's, it's much more complicated than that. And unfortunately, it go, comes up against this, what I said before, this idea of the modern Egypt. And we have to create something new and disciplined and organized. And the antithesis of that is where we are now. Back there. السلام عليكم انتصار يوسف باحثة حرة في إدارة المدن القديمة والمزدحمة حضرتك اتكلمت في الموضوع كويس جدا أنا بقالي حاجة وعشرين سنة بعمل أبحاث في إدارة المدن لقيت أن الدولة قامت بعمل بعمل كبير جدا في عمل بنا مباني جديدة وحديثة بأنظمة البلوكات أنظمة البلوكس ديت بتوجد ناس من طبقات مختلفة المشكلة الكبيرة اللي, بتو... اللي احنا بنواجهها عدم وجود حماية لهذه المساكن أنا حضرتك عملت يعني حصر كبير لمجموعة كبيرة من, ال... من الأماكن المختلفة اللي حضرتك بتتحول بمجرد, بمجرد خروج السكان الأصليين من المكان إلى ورش وإلى مصانع وإلى حاجات طبعا صناعية ما بتسمحش بأن الناس تقدر تعيش في هذه الأماكن النظام اللي اتخذته الدولة في أنها تساعد في حل مشكلة الإسكان هو نظام خاطئ تماما لأن لا يوجد حماية لهذه المساكن فحضرتك بنتواجد مجموعة من الأشخاص زي ما حضرتك ما قلت بالضبط من طبقات مختلفة من سوشيال مختلف من من تالتي من تعليم من كل كل واحد فيه لحاله كل واحد فينا بيعتقد انه مالك لهذه الوحدة بطرقه الخاصة وبقوته بيقدر ان هو يبيعها لو دور أرضي بيحولها أستأذنك السؤال معلش أنا أنا حضرتك بأوجد حلول بق بق يعني بعمل إضافة طب ممكن نبقى نرجع لحضرتك بس لو لو في سؤال قوليه لنا لو ما كانش بس علشان في ناس كتير مستنية معلش طيب الإضافة الثانية إن إحنا برضو حضرتك يعني موافق حضرتك أكمل 
آه. لا يعني حضرتك عندك سؤال ولا هتضيفي؟ انا هضيف بس ان انت في المدن الجديده لو اجدتي مجموعه الطرق سوري القطارات والمتروهات تقدري حضرتك تحسني في زيادة عدد السكان ثالث حاجة حضرتك تفعيل القانون تفعيل جيد ان انا مالكة لشقة عشان اأجرها بعد سنتين ثلاثة المالك يوضع يد السوري الساكن يوضع يد عليها لا بيوافق برفع الإيجار ولا بيوافق بالخروج منها ده حضرتك بيخلي 13 مليون وحدة مقفولة يعني ده شكرا شكرا أشكرك uh, We'll take the question behind اخر حد بقى ايوه ايوه حضرتك اه اوكي اه اوف طيب اي جست اي جست وونت تو اد ا فيو ثينجز ذا 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 ماتر ذات ايجيبت هاز او كايرو هاز 13 مليون ام تي ابارتمنتس I think it is directly linked to the idea that you called a very successful financial uh, uh, plan that the government is, uh, is doing, which is basically that they are selling the land with a high price, and then the developer has to put in the added value of developing the whole land, and then eventually the end user has to buy it at a very high cost. This puts us in a very uh, uh, critical situation that actually only a few margin of the Egyptian society can buy this type of development and at the same time <clears throat> sorry and the same time the egyptian government does not really have the financial resources to develop the entire city or town that they're aiming to do completely on their own which they don't they don't get to have a complete full solution uh, on their own my question is how do you develop a city like what is step one step two step three And then what is the actual time frame to have people move? If we take the 6th of October example, I think it took around 20 to 25 years for people to move from Cairo to there. What is the ideal or like let's say average time frame which is healthy for people to move from one city to a close by city, not even far in the desert? Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Uh, <clears throat> um, in China, people move a lot, uh, but in, uh, m mobility in Egypt is not, uh, family mobility in Egypt is not very high. And you'll see that all throughout the statistics. Uh, <clears throat> so how long does it take to develop a city? I don't know. I mean, uh, everybody points to uh, Heliopolis as a successful model. Uh, Medina Nas. Uh, was virtually empty until after the, the war, the 73 war, and it's, as, as a matter of fact, it's, Medina Nasr is the, has well over a million people, 1.3 million people in the High Awal or High Qasim Awal, Qasim Thani, and uh, it's the only part of formal Cairo which is really growing at a rapid pace. It's because it's more towers. So, The Medina Nasser model seems to be working, but I, I mean, I may be an urban planner, but I don't really think planning cities is, is, is a big discipline. It's a very rare example. You may design suburbs, or you may design extensions, but the number of successful, completely new towns is very rare. And I might point out that according to the 2017 census, there are 349,000 people in 6th of October. 6th of October was established in 1981 with a target population of 600,000. Or was it 750? I can't think. 750,000. So it hasn't even reached that. And now the government says it should have 6.5 million. That's their target. So. It's a moving, it's a moving target. Thank you. In a hole? لا اللي جنب حضرتك معلش وبعدين هنديك اه عشان بس هو كان مستني. هو كان Hi David. Uh, my name is Tari. I work in uh, community management for a real estate developer. Uh, 
-hmm. And uh, I have two questions. My first question is following up on the 13 million uh, vacant uh, units. Um, currently, right now, there's a social media campaign against uh, uh, carried out by car owners against uh, uh, car manufacturers and car dealers because of the uh, prices that they're selling, and it's called uh, Letter Trust or Khaliat Saddi. And um, as per your first book, it like car owners in Egypt represent around like eight percent of the total population, something along those Not lines. Even. Not even. Mm. So, if that's like the outcry or like um, uh, feedback from eight million people. When the real estate bubble bursts for the luxury real estate housing, what will be the, and will it, do you expect a similar outcry or a similar um, embargo against uh, real estate developers? That's my first question. <laughs> well, that's a, that would be an interesting uh, campaign to have. Uh, Just let it empty. Exactly. <laughs> uh, my second question is um, basically, uh, for real estate developer, its KPIs are, are measured by its ability to deliver units in a timely fashion. So, obviously, you've been delivering units for 40 years, both by NUCA and by the government. Um, why can't they impose, as a KPI, uh, residency, as opposed to handed over units? Well, here's, here's something. Why, don't they, uh, why doesn't the government uh, forbid uh, off-plan sales? You can't sell a, f a unit until it's, you can sell it with the key. Because none of these units are sold that way. All these units in all the new towns are what we call off-plan. You buy the thing based on a design, and you pay over, you see in the advertisements, no interest, eight years, no interest, 10 years. And they build the unit with your money. So a little reality might come in if they just said, no, sorry. Uh, we're going to control this. You can't even advertise unless the building's built. Now, that would be very interesting because nine-tenths of the developers could not develop. They would actually have to take loans out, big ones, and none of them want to do that. It's a, it's a model which fits so well, uh, uh, you could call it the marginal capitalist. Uh, he, all he needs is, uh, he has to buy the land, and even that from Nuka, and even the land is paid for over seven to 10 years. So his financial exposure is limited to maybe a couple <laughs> construction loans just to get things going. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a wonderful model for the developer. And that results in a lot of overbuilding and speculative uh, and, and, and uh, always looking for uh, speculative investment. So that's one thing. No more off plan. I didn't go down very well. Hmm. Uh, uh, we Egyptians are very patient people, and we are very good in tasia. And I imagine thousands of years ago, some expert asking, "What the hell are you building there in the desert of Memphis?" Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I've heard that one before, uh, but it's reached a new level. I mean, uh, uh, the, in the 90s, there was criticism of the new towns, and Salah al who worked for Wazarat uh, al-Iskan, uh, he said, we have a long, we're patient. We have a long view. We build it, and they will come. Uh, so maybe he's right. Please. Hi, thanks for your presentation. Um, I don't doubt your analysis of the data, but um, I live in Shirut, and I'm wondering whether you can estimate a little bit or whether you factored in the informal dimension that you referred to earlier. You said that Egyptians make do. Um, and so in the... Can you consider that? Or maybe you covered it and I missed it, but what is, to the number of people who officially live there, how many people from lower social classes, so not the elites, not the kind of exclusive mall goers that you're describing, also live there? 
Uh, Sharuk is doing very well. Sharuk has 87,000, uh, last year, had 87,000 people up from 20,000. That's quite a lot for a new town. Well, um, this, and this is based on the census. The census is a de facto census. It counts anybody they can find on a certain night or a certain day. And I'm sure included in that figure is an enormous percentage of bawabs, gardeners, drivers, and petty contractors. As a matter of fact, I know uh, there was a wonderful study done by some students at uh, the German University uh, a couple years ago about their own lives and where they lived. And it became very strong, out very strongly, that really in a lot of these places, especially the ones where there's <coughs> individual subdivisions uh, in all these new towns, there are more service people, BOABs, gardeners, you name it, than there are residents. And those people are the ones who, if anybody's greening the area, it's them. So there is a, cer a certain informality, but if you try to open a, a tire repair shop in Sharuk, you can't. I don't think so. Uh, back okay, here? back here. So my question is, whenever we talk about Egypt, people usually think of Cairo. So do you have any ideas for how to decentralize Egypt from Cairo and have developments happening elsewhere? What I'm thinking about is the east, because you have the Red Sea where you can export stuff. But do you have any other ideas for how to decentralize from Cairo and move away from it? Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> in 1981, the uh, USA, bless their heart, uh, hired Padco, which is a consulting firm, to do a very exhaustive national urban policy. And their, con their conclusions and recommendations were, this was 1981, new towns had just started. They said new towns are expensive and rarely work, and Egypt cannot afford them. However, there, are, there is great potential in secondary cities. You want to uh, slow down the growth of Cairo? You have Alex. You have Port Said, you have Ismailia, you have Suez, you have lots of secondary cities, which if you invested in, and especially in job uh, labor-intensive industry, you could create counter magnets. And unfortunately, um, Hasabullah Kafrawi, who was the minister at the time, didn't like the report and would not release it. And the rumor has it that there are still hundreds of volumes of this report sitting in the basement of the Ministry of Housing. And because it went against the new town policy, which was already state policy. Uh, and it has been consistently kept in front of uh, the state. Uh, uh, that's what state policy is. When you talk about spatial policy, it's new towns. And new agriculture, and new tourism. Uh, the gentleman here. Uh, this is Nader, a uh, student at the College of Commerce and Political Science. Could you, could you raise your voice a little? This is Nader, a uh, student at the final year in the uh, Faculty of Economics and Political Science. Uh, well, the core of my question is about the political imaginations of the current political regime. Uh, do you think the, the current political regime seeks more legitimacy by building these new cities, uh, or it's just to try to, to guarantee his own security um, and to just, in another word, to build a wall around that? Yeah, interesting. I would say the first. It's, it's, it's wrapped up with the legitimacy of the state as the vanguard of development. And we've been watching this through, I've been watching it through one, two, well, Sadat, <clears throat> Mubarak, and now President Assisi. It, it, that's what mega projects are all about. And it's not just Egypt. I mean, uh, many countries do this. Uh, it turns out that Algeria has new towns too. Uh, <clears throat> they're all called Buflika. Uh, yes, please. Hi, my name is Rana Rashidi. Well, um, 
Hi. Well, I have a question regarding Nuka entering the development market as a real estate developer. Now, how do you see this influencing other real estate developers per se? And, and I mean, they entered the competition as a real estate developer and also in the private um, education sector by introducing new universities as well. And this is very interesting because when you were mentioning the personal um, example of where to invest your money to get more mo to get more money back, you mentioned real estate, selling lands, and um, private ed education, and this is exactly where the NUCA is entering the market. I mean, they state that this is, the official statement state that they're using this money to actually fund the development of this, these new towns, but do you think this is actually going to happen, or this is not going to happen? And um, also, they say, they say that the university, uh, that the, sorry, that the market is actually open for everybody, and there's room for everybody. Do you think this is fair, or because I, as far as I understand, they don't pay much or at all for the land itself? That's the first question. <laughs> well, let me answer that one. Um, first of all, Nuka is both a, de a master developer and a developer. Uh, and the, the new model, which has been used a few times for large chunks of land, over 100 fed dans, is they become a part, the developer and Nuka become a partner. They, so the developer doesn't even have to buy the land, but he has to agree that a percentage of the units, or a percentage more likely, of the revenues go to Nuka. And that's a stiff one. That's now usually between 40 and 50 percent. So there's a part. It's a partnership because they both, you know, uh, you know, uh, are, are, are have to incur risk. But I don't know if that's being used in the in these uh, in, in in for the uh, new schools. But it certainly shows that that's where the market is, or it seems to be. Uh, it turns out uh, there's a Canadian university which is actually already operating in the new capital. Yes, working with generators. They don't even have electricity. And they're busing everybody in. But, well, if I were the, uh, the new administrative capital company, I would try to get some people some activity out there as soon as possible. And that's exactly what they've done. It's, it's, a, it's a real estate uh, strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, we will take uh, one more question. So no pressure, but let it be uh, a strong one. Uh, so here you go. أنا اسمي أحمد عودة دلوقتي المشهد يبدو كما ذكرت أنه مخيف مدن جديدة بلا سكان ومناطق صناعية بلا صناعات حقيقية فهل هنصل إلى حائط صد في النهاية وما مصير التريليونات اللي أنفقت على المشاريع ديت بلا جدوى وفي النهاية يعني هيكون المصير إيه هل هيحدث انهيار للسوق العقاري قريبا ما أعتقدش انهيار السوق العقاري لو في انهيار سوق العقاري طبقة كبيرة من مجتمع مصر هيفقد كل أموالهم ولا يستطيع الحكومة يسمع هذا يبقى الوضع هيستمر زي ما هو Uh, I want to thank everyone uh, for being here. Uh, what David gave us today is a lot of food for thought. Uh, cities are not just about you know developments and housing, but it's uh, first and foremost about people. And policies uh, are about people. And there seems to be um, not enough uh, prioritization of uh, people in the current existing policies of urban development, uh, housing, or even industrialization. If you haven't signed up for our newsletter to 
know about our talks, get our, our announcements, uh, please sign up on your way out. Um, we have commentaries, we have a very active uh, website, and our next public lecture, as I said, will be same place on the 23rd of April with uh, Dr. Ziad Bahaeddin on Egypt's investment uh, dilemma. Thank you very much, and thank you very much, David, uh, for an interesting I, talk. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on. Can I add something? Sure. If anybody asks you what I said, I think there's a lot of hope. <laughs> okay? And I think, no, I, I'm, not, I'm not joking. You know, people are putting in, the, the government is putting in a lot of effort in what it's doing. It may not always be right, but uh, you have to ha hand it to them for uh, uh, putting, a, mobilizing a lot of resources and a lot of energy into a difficult project. Thanks. Thank you, David.